Uh, Mini Peaks uh, listed a, a little over a year ago uh, in March uh, 2022. Uh, during that first year of operations, we advanced gold and copper assets in Queensland. Uh, from early 2023, uh, we've been active with business development, uh, quite focused on expanding our project pipeline. Uh, initial acquisitions we made were beginning of this year, we optioned, oh, sorry, we can go to another slide. Um, thanks. Yeah, uh, you can see from our portfolio there, uh, we're very focused on tier one jurisdictions. So all of our projects in Canada and Australia, uh, with our early acquisitions being uh, this year, the Odyssey Rare Earth Element Project uh, in Labrador. Uh, we also acquired the Aska Lithium Project, uh, which came along while doing due diligence uh, on the other project. We identified an opportunity for direct staking, so low cost acquisitions for the company. Uh, on the next slide, you can see uh, a few investment highlights listed there, but the key ones I would want to highlight is uh, amongst that exposure to the critical mineral sector that we're gaining. Uh, it comes amongst a pipeline of drill ready targets, and these are established from existing uh, drill intercepts and, and surface mineralization. So fairly advanced projects that will be working over the coming year and all backed by a, an experienced team and a, a track record of discovery. Uh, on the next slide, I can see a bit of background about our team. Uh, I'm a geologist with 25 years experience. Uh, our team across the board. Uh, has quite a bit of experience uh, in the mineral sector uh, with Marcus and I both being geologists working across several continents uh, and across multiple uh, commodities, uh, including uh, previous experience where our involvement has uh, been associated with projects that have gone on to commercial development. Uh, regarding the company, uh, currently have just shy of 40 million shares on issue, uh, but just shy of 10 million listed options. Uh, that came from a loyalty bonus that we did to shareholders uh, back in December, uh, which are now listed and trading well. And as of last quarter, our, our cash position was 3.75 million, uh, which I believe uh, not only covers the work programs I'll cover in the coming slides, but takes us through follow-up programs into 20, 2024. Uh, so we'll go through those in the next slide, um, starting with Canada. Uh, just a quick overview of where we're at. Uh, we've got two projects in the Labrador and Newfoundland province. Uh, again, the Odyssey project, uh, an option that we have to get in and have a look at that project. Uh, we'll just go ahead and go to the next slide on that and zoom into the, the Odyssey project. Uh, yeah, this project saw quite a bit of attention in the first or the last uh, or most recent uh, rare earths price boom in 2010-11. Uh, a lot of activity in what is known as the Red Wine District uh, here in Labrador. Uh, this particular project area saw quite a bit of rock chipping, but the district is a known rare earth district. And just 20 kilometers to the east uh, during that time period, uh, a resource was drilled out called the Tutom Project. Uh, and across about 1.1 to 1.3 kilometers of strike, uh, there's a 40 million ton resource there rating uh, about 1.16 total rare earth oxide. Uh, so a lot of tons pulled together quickly in a, a relatively short strike extent due to the widths of these systems. Uh, similarly, five kilometers to the east, a bit closer to Odyssey, uh, and just off the map there, uh, is a project that received six holes in 2010-11, and the better intercepts there returning 44 meters at 1.22, 70 meters at 1% total rare earth oxide. So you, you can see some significant widths, which we believe is the same case here at Odyssey, which never got the drill attention, uh, but we see what we do see is some higher tenor mineralization at surface uh, that has yet to be uh, followed up. Uh, we'll have field crews moving into this project uh, in the next month. Uh, we'll be doing channel sampling and some initial shallow drill tests just to show, the, demonstrate the continuity uh, across the widths where in mapping we see 50 up to 90 meter widths uh, of the mineralized lithology, and all of that sitting on uh, two key trends that total uh, over three kilometers of strike extent to be explored. Uh, on the next slide at the ASCA project, uh, we're currently in the progress of zooming into this area, but what really attracted us into Newfoundland uh, is you got a, you're hosted in rocks that also host some major lithium resources uh, in the Americas, the Piedmont lithium projects, uh, the previous mining by Albemarle at Kings Mountain, and Gang Fen of 
taken control of the Avalonia project in Ireland. Uh, each of these projects are hosted in the same intrusion rocks uh, that were part of the Avalon subcontinent. Uh, so you had a collision zone that formed positive intrusions for these LCT type pegmatites. Uh, and when the Pangaea supercontinent broke apart, uh, these were all ripped apart and have been scattered either side of the Atlantic and, and down the uh, coast of North America. So probably the largest area of uh, coverage for these types of intrusions is across Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, where exploration for lithium is only in its infancy. Uh, the ASCA project itself is surrounded by a number of Canadian explorers focused on lithium, uh, the more advanced of which would be uh, the Benton Sokoman JV, who have lithium and cesium discoveries in pegmatites uh, just 50 kilometers to the east of us, uh, with a number of other explorers uh, surrounding us. Uh, our work to date, uh, we're just initiating the reconnaissance work, uh, satellite imagery where we can identify pegmatites. We've identified more than 350 pegmatite targets in a eight by 12 kilometer area. So generally a strong pegmatite uh, swarm uh, in the area, and we're just getting on the ground. We're already identifying tourmaline and barrel key indicator minerals for the LCT type uh, and actively vectoring in towards where there's potential for a Goldilocks zone, uh, as it's referred to, where you start to get development of the spodgeny. Uh, next slide. Uh, coming back to home, closer to home, Queensland. Um, we've recently done a, just in the last month, a transaction that more than doubles our land position within the uh, highly prospective Yarrow Gold province. Uh, we've got a land position uh, in and around the Mount Rodden project, a uh, 2.3 million ounce resource currently being operated by Evolution Gold. Uh, we're bookended by that project and the 7.6 million ounce Mount Morgan. So a well-endowed area with also some exploration success being reported by Triumph and uh, Mount Peninda uh, in and amongst our land positions. Uh, and the next slide, we'll zoom in onto that Yarrow project. Uh, so here, obviously in a major gold corridor, uh, some very advanced gold projects in here. Uh, what's highlighted for us with a bit of a focus into the critical mineral sector is just in the last year, a new discovery for cobalt has been identified uh, six kilometers north of previous gold drilling. Uh, these are in Eocene tertiary sediments that are hosting heavy mineral sands. Uh, these sands have never been identified in a previous mapping, uh, basically in an inverted topography. Old fluvial uh, drainages are up at topo highs, and in the base of those, we're seeing manganese oxides trap co both cobalt and nickel, uh, forming a, a one to three meter horizon, uh, where we're seeing up to 1% cobalt grades in situ. Uh, across the broader widths, uh, seeing variable grades from 4% uh, down to even 380 ppm, which seemed a bit low, but we've just completed the gravity concentration tests over these intervals. And uh, encouragingly, even 380 ppm cobalt, we're seeing upgrade to better than 1% through simple dense media separation techniques, uh, which is the same beneficiation process that you would apply towards all the heavy mineral sands. Uh, so what we're seeing is up to 20 meter thicknesses of heavy mineral sand uh, potential. And at the base of that, uh, a very high value uh, manganese, cobalt and nickel uh, mineral product that could be generated in amongst the other uh, high value metals that, minerals that we're seeing, uh, of which in preliminary work, we're seeing some uh, zircon, rutiles, uh, leucoxine and even monazite. So be interesting. Uh, Preliminary drilling there has confirmed that manganese cobalt horizon extends for about four kilometer strike extent, which is substantial already. Uh, but the target area does extend for about an eight by 13 kilometer area. So with confidence that we can beneficiate that, we've gone ahead with air core drilling, uh, covering about a 40 square kilometer area to expand the footprint of that cobalt zone and, and see if that's of interest. Uh, all that's through low cost air core drilling which in mineral sands is the, the appropriate technique. So all of that can roll directly into resource estimation and uh, quite quickly advance towards resource if something's there. On the next slide, we'll zoom into that gold area that's to the south. Uh, we're still quite excited about the gold at the Yarrow project. A lot of high grade intercepts uh, in particular this year was reported 17.8 meters at four grams per ton. Uh, this was done on a whole in a different orientation than previous drilling. 
uh, it outlines that mineralization is uh, quite open uh, in and amongst these previous intercepts, most of which are within 60 meters of surface. So this is a open drilled mineralization, open at depth and a long strike um, with quite a bit of uh, volume potential to increase. And I think with these types of grades, as you can see, uh, 12 meters of 20, uh, and some of the drilling in the central ridge area, uh, which has been offset by our 17.8 meters of four, uh, we believe there's potential here to build some ounces very quickly. Uh, and all of this in uh, pretty close proximity to the, the Mount Rodden deposit area. And the Mount Stedman project on the next slide, uh, just the other side of Mount Rodden, uh, this is similar to Yarl and it's only shallowly drilled. Uh, all of this drilling is within 40 to 50 meters of surface. Uh, there's some high grade vein intercepts uh, in amongst the drilling here. So you do get the two meters at 110, uh, two meters at 12. Uh, these types of intercepts haven't really been followed up. Uh, from surface though, uh, interesting, you're getting uh, 19 to 25 meter on what appears to be a, a more than 20 meter true width zone of mineralization at surface running a gram per ton. So only in the last year, the vendors of this project started stepping out on this and they've had success in repeating that 200 PPM soil anomalism uh, for up to another kilometer to the north and have continued that sampling. And we believe it's highly likely we can extend that footprint of soil anomalism out to three and a half kilometers. And that's gonna generate multiple targets uh, to expand the footprint of that 20 meter wide zone already identified in previous drilling. And uh, it'll be quite exciting then to, once we understand that, start chasing that down dip. Uh, look at volume increases once you have a, an increase in the footprint. I think uh, nearly the final slide. Well, uh, one last slide on our legacy assets. Um, where we're up against the uh, Caninda resource. We have a number of high grade copper uh, at surface exposures, covering a five kilometer by five kilometer target area with uh, porphyry potential, uh, a bit earlier stage than some of our rec recent acquisitions, but we'll continue to work on these projects and map and come to a better understanding to see if we have drill targeting to do here. Uh, on our final slide, a uh, bit of an outline of our work program. Uh, as I mentioned, we're actively drilling uh, at the Plateau Cobalt project. Uh, We'll put about four to 5,000 meters of air core, uh, understanding the size potential of that target. Uh, we'll also continue with the metallurgical and basically mineralogical study work to understand the heavy mineral sands that are hosting uh, the cobalt there. Uh, at the Odyssey project, uh, previously mentioned, we will be commencing field activities uh, for rare earths in July and expect results uh, on that project in Q3. Uh, the lithium project, we're actively doing reconnaissance work uh, that's boots on the ground following up uh, with field validation of the satellite targets that we've generated and see if there's some low-hanging fruit there for uh, outcropping uh, lithium mineralization. And concurrent with that, then we'll still be advancing the gold and copper. Uh, anticipate a small amount of drilling into our gold projects uh, later this year uh, for confirmatory work and structural studies to advance those gold projects. Uh, all of these uh, easily funded in the 3.7 million cash balance we had uh, as of March uh, with adequate cash balance there to fund follow-up where we have success uh, going into 2024. Uh, Thanks, Travis. Uh, yeah. Great presentation. Shouldn't be called many peaks, probably many opportunities might be a more apt name. Um, now, just Turkey, talking about the cobalt market, there's been some fluctuations recently in terms of pricing. How does the dynamic for cobalt work? Um, I guess the the smaller cycles, I suppose, hasn't uh, affect well impacted our decision to go into cobalt too much. Uh, we're mostly focused on the larger scale uh, supply and, and demand side of things. So, uh, on the demand side, I think there's plenty of things you can cite and quote, and it's quite clear cobalt is going to be important in the uh, development of EV batteries uh, and battery storage as we work towards a fossil fuel uh, mandate. Uh, I quite like Simon Michaud's research uh, in particular. Uh, he does some mass calculations, which he, even he comments are, are crude estimates. But when you look at those, the, uh, the 2019 global reserve for cobalt uh, equated to about three and a half percent of the amount of cobalt required uh, to make a transition to a fossil free, fossil fuel free uh, economy. So, 
uh, a lot of cobalt is going to be required over the coming years. Uh, on the supply side of things, 80% of the current supply is coming out of the DRC. Uh, we see an ongoing increase towards uh, ESG reporting uh, and requirement. And our belief is uh, ethically sourced cobalt uh, domestically in Australia has the potential to uh, attract a premium uh, over the global cobalt market. So, yeah, we'd definitely be interested in uh, establishing offtake uh, type agreements that could take advantage of where the cobalt is sourced from. Staying with Yarrell, were you surprised by the cobalt discovery in the first instance? And then what's now excited you about the project? Uh, yeah, I guess the fact that, uh, as I mentioned, the, the sands don't really show up on the map. Uh, it's just an opportunity that's never really been identified uh, in the previous mapping uh, for the area. Uh, so all of this was identified through stream sediment and soil mapping uh, by the vendor who uh, highlighted the, the manganese and cobalt, uh, took a bit of mapping into the foothills of the plateau to really start to identify a source. But you clearly have uh, these manganese oxides outcropping at surface with better than 1% cobalt uh, extending for four kilometers of strike extent. Uh, so now the key question for us, uh, the initial drilling pushes that in for about a kilometer underneath that plateau uh, with room to go another six to seven kilometers to the north. So understanding the size potential of that uh, is going to be key. Now, we've got a question here regarding the Odyssey project. Um, talk us through the mineralogy. Is it a carbonite, a carbonatite, um, or how does the mineralogy work, or is it too early to call? Uh, no, not too early. There's been, uh, well, we're doing our work based on mineralogical studies for the Tutom resource to the east. Uh, it's not a carbonatite. It's a para-alkaline uh, intrusion. Uh, on the margins of a, uh, of a shear zone. So in the metamorphics, the rare earths have been upgraded through remobilization of the minerals. So there's a bit of rare earths in veining, uh, cross-cutting an already uh, rare earth endowed uh, rock type. Uh, they do see quite a bit of monazite in those. Uh, probably red wine districts known, there is uh, to the west of us uh, a red wine deposit, uh, which is more in heavy rare earths. Uh, where we're working is predominantly light rare earths. We're seeing a strong endowment of uh, the neodymium and prisodymium uh, are the high value in the light rare earths. Uh, amongst the heavy rare earths, uh, those are hosted amongst eudialite, and there's some uh, mineralogical challenges uh, to the heavy rare earth style mineralization, but that's not where we're located. Uh, we're trying to get a bit better understanding of how the what the mineralogy is amongst the light rare earths uh, along the northern boundary of the, the red wine district. And yeah, the previous studies have been encouraging with the amount of monazite, monazite they see in, in amongst those, but that's 20 kilometers to east and the mineralogy does change uh, along strikes. So that's uh, will be a key focus of our exploration program in July. For those watching uh, at home, at work, at their desk, wherever they are, who understand uh, the opportunities in Canada, particularly given a lot of um, a lot of movement by Aussie juniors into that area, give me the the one minute pitch on Newfoundland. Um, well, basically, uh, I think I mean everybody's aware of Saint James uh, James Bay, which has uh, had a lot of activity and in, uh, influx for Aussie juniors. It's had a lot of initial success. Uh, I think you have a similar footprint there. I think there's a number of emerging districts for lithium to come in Canada. And Newfoundland, uh, you've got uh, Origin Resources bookending us, uh, who are uh, a lithium-focused company, but also quite focused on their assets in Argentina. Uh, we've got um, Brunswick Exploration, who borders us on the west side of our project. They're across all of Canada uh, and in some of the best uh, lithium jurisdictions. So I really feel... Yeah, Newfoundland is an emerging district, and we're going to see a lot more discoveries uh, come out of that belt. Many peaks, many opportunities, big workflow, exciting times ahead, a lot to see, well-funded quality team. Travis, keep an eye on many peaks, put it on your watch list. Uh, clearly a hidden gem uncovered here today as part of the Share Cafe Hidden Gems webinar series. Travis, thanks for your time. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you, David. Appreciate the time. Cheers.